Hello. In February 1603, Queen Elizabeth I began to complain of insomnia and loss of appetite. She'd been on the throne for 44 years. It was clear that she would leave no heir, and her death had been long expected. But when its imminence became apparent, there were widespread fears of insurrection. A complex, highly stakes series of manoeuvres followed, and there are devils in the details. To some, Elizabeth's passing and the arrival of a younger male monarch, James I, with wife and children, seemed as much a liberation as a loss. And yet in death she became a mythic figure, and remained all too present as her Scottish successor began his troubled reign in England. With me to discuss the death of Elizabeth I are John Guy, Fellow of Clare College, University of Cambridge, Claire Jackson, Lecturer and Director of Studies in History at Trinity Hall at the University of Cambridge, and Helen Hackett, Reader in English at University College London. John Guy, by February 1603, when Elizabeth falls what became terminally ill, people had been expecting her to die. That uh, What do they most fear will happen when she dies? What they fear will happen is, is disorder because she has made no provision for the succession. In that sense, she was quite irresponsible. Henry VIII had left her a will defining who would succeed him. Uh, she has no child. She has not married. Now, of course, uh, will the, will, there are Catholics uh, who um, need to be brought into the system. There are Catholic loyalists and there are Catholics who, who, who oppose her. How will the succession be handled? People are, of course, expecting that um, James will be a, an important candidate, but he's 400 miles away. Um, he's a Scot. That is a matter of, of, great, of great concern. Uh, of course, much of the politicking is happening inside the, insi ins inside the royal palace. Elizabeth falls sick, essentially, um, because the Countess of Nottingham dies on the 24th of February. And that's what sets the clock ticking in the short term. And then she's ill for a month. I don't get it. Why does the clock tick because the Countess of Nottingham died? In the short term. Oh. In the long term, of course, you know, there have been other considerations, but in the short term, uh, the clock starts ticking then and she won't eat, she, she can't sleep, she has no appetite, uh, you know, she can't get to the, um, the chapel to hear uh, the, ser the service, she has to sit on cushions. So, we, and the rumours outside, you've talked about the Catholics, the Catholics are in touch with Spain, it isn't very long since the Spanish Armada came, the biggest fleet ever put to sea, which because of the wind and the rain of the English skill was dispersed. Um, so the, the, the worries are the worries from the Puritans, the worries of insurrections of the common people, as they were then called. So there's quite a bit bubbling around out there, isn't there? I mean, the, 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 the question is, to get, this, to, to get a succession established smoothly, the great difficulty is rumour, you need support in London. Uh, you, I mean, there are rumours that Elizabeth is dead, um, in, running around in Leicestershire, you know, on the sort of the 20, 20, 20 22nd. Uh, they put the watches out in the city of London, uh, you know, they put the constables on, 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 on full alert. I mean, on the day of Elizabeth's death, uh, you know, there's a sort of deathly hush in London for we about 12 hours. We haven't got there hours. yet. We wanted to get there. We, we, we've, got, we've got three weeks to go. Mm. Uh, the man who was orchestrating this in a way, making sure that, 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 that there will not be, that the worst will not happen, is Sir Robert Cecil. Absolutely. And uh, the Queen's Chief Minister. Um, so he was all-powerful, or did he have to watch out? Had he got enemies at court? Uh, the thing about Robert Cecil is that uh, you have to go back in a way to Essex's revolt in 1601, because Cecil and uh, the Second Earl of Essex had been great rivals. Uh, and uh, in 1601, Cecil boxed in Essex and he rebelled. And he that, he that was the end of him. You know, he was executed. <coughs> now, uh, in in the run up to Elizabeth's death, Cecil is in one sense all powerful, but in another <coughs> sense, he's extremely vulnerable. Uh, he doesn't know what's going to happen either. He's making a lot of preparations. You know, he's been writing to James. He's trying to get the nobility involved. You know, he's been writing to the Earl of Northumberland. And these are potentially treasonous, aren't they? Activities. They are potentially treasonous. And of mm. course, I mean, he had to pretend to Elizabeth that he wasn't doing it. Uh, and of course, she knew that he probably was, but she chose to turn a blind eye. But what Cecil's also doing is hedging his bets. He's buying land, uh, borrowing money in the city of London. He's buying land to establish, in a sense, him, himself as a sort of great independent lord, so that if you know it all goes wrong, he can he can retire. So there she is. People know a fear that this is the last, the last stroke, really, the last, the last part of her, her life. And, and the court outside, there's, there's, there's great anxieties, and inside, there's great scheming. Uh, Claire Jackson, is there a broader sense of unease? I've, I've hinted at it, but can you just fill it in in the country, in the 
at the end of the uh, 1590s? I think this is very much a sort of fantasy atmosphere of insecurity as well as the anxiety over the succession. There are broader socioeconomic concerns. There's been a series of grain harvests, prices are going up, wages grain are falling. Failures. Grain grain sorry, grain grain, grain harvest failures. Um, prices going up, uh, wages falling, population rising, a growing distinction between rich and poor in the towns there's been plague and influenza decimating urban communities. Um, and the Elizabethan poor laws that for all their shortcomings remain the backbone of English poor legislation till the 1830s are framed in this decade and they give an indication of the sheer proportion of the population that are hovering around subsistence or actually living in poverty. So those socioeconomic tensions are probably exacerbated, well, are exacerbated by the fact that England is also at war in the 1590s, the period of military non-intervention, a policy of military non-intervention that Elizabeth had pursued stopped in the mid-1580s, England's now at war places strains on the treasury. It also means that there's rising xenophobia and war weariness in the 1590s. Um, there are criminally inclined deserters, troops being billeted on the populations. So there's a rise in crime and vagrancy. A lot of that's met with quite harsh repressive authoritarianism. So there's a real sense that there might be just an undercurrent of trouble. So the vacuum of power that will emerge whenever Elizabeth dies, and obviously that could be at any point really in the 1590s, is, is against this much broader background of unease generally, this feeling, as well as being at war, that England could at any point be encircled by these much superior counter-reformation forces. And alongside Essex's revolt that John alluded to, Spain invades Ireland in 1601, it's a fiasco, but there's always this fear that Ireland might be that very worrying Catholic side door into England. So that sort of mix of socioeconomic distress and war is, is quite a potent worrying background. Let's go into it even further. Was there a sense then in the late 90s that this was Elizabeth's fault, that the country, because she went with the execution of her of Mary Queen of Scots in 87, wasn't mm -hmm. um, she'd got rid of a lot of problems at great cost to herself, emotional cost, which we might come to, and the Spanish Armada was a great triumph, and she was given a lot of credit for that, speech at Tilbury and so on. But this build-up in the 90s, I just want to get it clear to the listeners, was very, very serious. The country was in serious trouble and very unstable economically and politically and was she blamed? I think there is there is a sense of fear and, and anxiety, it's very easy retrospectively to say well, as we'll probably see later in the programme that the succession is, is not as disruptive as it, as it might have been but no, no, nobody knows that in advance and that question that John alluded to at the outset I mean, when one asks what should a monarch do, often the first duty is surely to secure, secure the succession from the very beginning of Elizabeth's reign in 1558, it was it wasn't clear how she could be secure in her throne unless she produced an heir. So the very first day of her first parliament, the House of Commons gave her a petition urging her to marry. Uh, she makes very clear that her position is not to declare the succession right from the beginning of her reign. As she famously put it, people will look to the rising than to the setting sun. She didn't want an alternative constituency around her. Going to the, as they did in the time of the Georges, they, yes, the yes, Hanoverian then, reign. They but even in, the even in, yes, yeah, even in Elizabeth's own reign, she'd been, in, at low light, sorry, in Elizabeth's own lifetime, she'd been aware that during Mary's reign, um, those who didn't like the reign had looked to her, so she didn't want an alternative rival power base. But actually, very soon, she succumbs to smallpox in 1562, and that shows the fragility of her succession, as well as the whole Protestant establishment. And those fears are obviously much more acute the more that she begins to seem no longer immortal in the 1590s. Um, a Puritan MP Peter Wentworth in 1593 urges her to declare her succession and is placed in the Tower of London for four years for refusing not to, you know, for refusing to remain silent. I mean, interestingly, he makes the argument that if she doesn't um, declare her successor, she'll remain unburied at her death because all of her courtiers and all of her officials will only have their posts for as long as her reign continues. Um, so you would need to find a successor who would need to be crowned and or identified and crowned before she could be buried, and that could take weeks or months. Elizabeth tries to get around this by saying that she's not to be disemboweled, so the courts will decay so rapidly that she'll have to be buried. But it is an indication of how irresponsible is a word that's already been used. This decision not to name a successor could be seen to be. Helen Haggard, can we bring to bear the uh, literature of the period in the, la in the late <coughs> 90s and very early 17th century with regard to the prospect of Elizabeth's death? What was it saying? We, we tend yeah. to think of it as being very reticent and fearful and masked and metaphorical, but can you get well, more out of it, it than is. that? It's very double-sided. Yeah. This is the period when we get the most extravagance in the praise of Elizabeth. So we have poetry which is saying she's conquered time, she's ever young, she's going to live forever, she's immortal. And I think the way we 
can read that with retrospect is it's actually bespeaking this anxiety about her death. The more they protest that she's immortal, the more they're actually very conscious of her mortality. Um, running counter to that... So Who are in, these poets? Can you give us some names? Well, uh, court poets, uh, people like uh, Sir John Davis writes some verses of the Queen at Christmas 1602, which uh, present her as a sort of virgin saint and um, say, uh, virgins milk, the church of God doth feed, and they talk about her conquering time, her living forever. That's a very recurrent theme in the public poetry of the 1590s, but in manuscript you have more sinister, more bitter notes being sounded. Uh, there's Henry Cuff, who's secretary to the Earl of Essex, and he's very much involved in the Essex uprising in 1601. And he writes a poem where he imagines all the courtiers as insects and they're all feeding on a rose, which is Elizabeth, and they're all glutting and surfeiting on this rose. And Cuff writes, I work on weeds when moon is in the wane. And clearly this, this waning moon is Elizabeth and he's expressing, expressing his disaffection, his cynicism. Uh, the moon image very much comes to the fore because you can use it to suggest that she's conquered time because of the way the moon renews itself through its cycles, but also, of course, the moon has a dark side, a sinister side. It's associated with the occult, with mutability, particularly female mutability. So even in the more public court poetry, even, say, Spencer's poetry, Raleigh's poetry very much, we have the moon image being used to express ostensible praise of Elizabeth, but within that there are often these quite clear notes of dissent and mm -hmm. cynicism. Can you illustrate that? Uh, yes, uh, Shakespeare is actually a good example. In A Midsummer Night's Dream, um, Oberon has a vision of an imperial votress, a fair vestal throned by the West, which is clearly Elizabeth. Th th this is how he explains how the love charm comes into being, because this imperial votress is immune to Cupid's arrow and it falls instead on the flower, which becomes the love charm. Uh, but the way he describes this imperial votress, she's very ethereal, again she's the moon uh, the Which moon is, is an image commonly used for Elizabeth Yeah, first, very much, it? the yeah. predominant image in the 1590s and she sort of drifts off the scene, very chaste, sterile ghostly, she's very much at odds with all the other imagery of love and marriage and youthfulness which is predominant in the Midsummer Night's Dream and right at the beginning of that play when um, Theseus is complaining about the delay of his marriage, he says uh, how slow this old moon wanes, she lingers my desires like to a step dame or a dowager long withering out a young man's revenue and I think we can quite plausibly read into that impatience among the young men of the nation about this old woman lingering and a feel of stagnation that's, that's coming with that. Can we go for a few moments into the details of the last few days because I found them fascinating. We, we, we're dealing with let's say 21 days now we've got close reports on that don't we? Can you just, we've got, uh, so tell us that how close we are to knowing about it, real reports from the, the bedchamber and then we'll go into one or two of the things that happened there. Yes. The, the, the problem is that the reports are so varying. We have Elizabeth Southall who's a lady in waiting in Elizabeth's bedchamber but she later becomes a Catholic and the reports that, she gives... Does that factor make her unreliable? Well it makes makes her biased. It makes her want to present Elizabeth's death as surrounded by sort of sinister doings and uncertainties. And uh, she talks about Elizabeth being, being haunted by visions of her own wasted body. Um, she talks about how a playing card of the Queen of Hearts with a nail through its head was found on the bottom of Elizabeth's chair. And after Elizabeth's death, she, she says that her corpse was so full of noxious vapours that it exploded in the coffin. Now, she's the only one who gives us these details, so they are perhaps not entirely She talks right. about her having nightmares and stabbing the arrows, doesn't she? she d no, that's Sir John Harrington, ah, sorry, right. who is um, Elizabeth's godson, a sort of favourite godson, and he talks about how he visits Elizabeth in November 1602. She's very melancholy, and he talks about her walking around her chamber, st stabbing the arrows with her sword in case there are interlopers and treasonous plotters there. John Guy, there's this unwillingness to die, which is splendid in a way. It's, um, can you just talk about she wouldn't go back to bed, as I understand it, because she said if she did, she'd never get out of it. And can you... Well, well, she wouldn't go to bed because she said, you know, she'd never get out of it. But, uh, you know, I think, um, I think she knows, by certainly by the end of February, that her number's up. And, uh, you know, she is, um, she, is just, she is just waiting. You see, one has to get a sense of what Elizabeth is actually like. Yeah, well, I want, that's uh, what I want to get. At, 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 at that time. I mean, she, 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 she's bald, she wears a wig. Um, her, her breath stinks, her teeth are bad because she absolutely had a fad for sugar, you know, much earlier, earlier in her life. Uh, she wears, a, she puts a silk uh, perfumed handkerchief in her mouth when she receives any visitors. And she won't appear without her makeup. And to look between her, you know, look beneath her makeup would you know, essentially require an archaeological dig. Uh, you know, she's 70, uh, she's in, in her 70th year. Uh, uh, she's reigned for 44 years. Uh, out there, I mean, as Claire has said, 
you know, there are quite a lot of people, you know, who would like to see the back of her. Can I go to the evidence, though? What is the best evidence, in your opinion, from those last... Who is... Because there are people sending messages back here, them everywhere, the Venetian ambassador saying she's dead, really, and there's a... a dead. So what's the best evidence for what was going on in those days? Because what about her standing all the time and only sitting on cushions, not going to bed, that sort of thing? Is that true, or are we in mismaking or mere gossip? Um... No, I think, I mean, as Helen said, there's a range of different testimonies, many of which are looking to the future as well in terms of how they want to place it. Um, there are certainly manoeuvres that have been happening, as, as has been explained, between Cecil and the English court, looking primarily to James. <coughs> I mean, the one thing that Elizabeth might might have been said to have done is placed obstacles in the range of various other there's a whole host of people who might have a weaker claim to the throne and even if she won't name James as her successor um, she certainly has placed obstacles in the paths of others so um, Cecil has a correspondence um, as various others with, with James where people are, are writing in, in code and the, so we begin to get a sense of preparations taking place there um, and James himself is at this stage writing um, accounts of um, or making his own preparations so we have this place, just to finish on this before we, we move on, uh, <coughs> Helen, the, in this confined to this room, she can scarcely get out of her yes. room, really, can't go to the yes. chapel, which is just next door, with cushion, yep. ladies in waiting, follow her with cushions so she can sit whenever she wants, standing. Um, what can, do we have a report of the actual death? You would sort of expect, from people's expectation yeah. would be of great things happening when the great <laughs> Virgin Queen died. What? Do we know what did happen? Well, well, some of the other reports, some of the perhaps more reliable reports are from people like Robert Carey, who's her cousin, who's around the court waiting for news of her death because he's ready to ride up to James with the news. Uh, there's John Manningham, who's a law student in London at the time, and he's a friend of one of Elizabeth's chaplains, so he's getting news straight from the bedchamber. And basically what they talk about is that she's suffering from fever, sleeplessness, she has swelling in her throat, pain in her throat, she has increasing difficulty in speaking. Now, of course, the big question for her ministers is will she name a successor because of this problem we keep returning to of the succession. And the reports vary. Some say she named James Camden in retrospect, who's writing a kind of official formal history. He says, oh, yes, yeah, she named James because he wants to affirm James's authority. Others, like Elizabeth Southall, say she went to her grave not having named anybody. It seems quite likely she made some sort of sign or gesture which Cecil and the council chose to interpret as affirming James. Um, she spends a lot of time in the final days in prayer. She's visited by Archbishop Whitgift, the Archbishop of Canterbury. Her chaplains spend a lot of time with her. But towards the end, everyone withdraws. She's left just with about three ladies in waiting. One last interpolation. Yeah. There's, there was talk of her feeling great guilt for the death of her of, of, yes. of, of uh, Mary Queen of Scots sister yes. and of the of sending Essex after his rebellion yes. in sixty one her latest lover to the tower and his execution. Yes. Do those play into it's rather interesting how these you know we might think these are rather sort of anti Elizabeth interpretations or even in the case of Essex quite a romantic interpretation that she pines for the death of Essex, but even in the more sort of um, official accounts, if I can put it like that, they revert to this. Sir Robert Carey says he'd never heard her heave such sighs since the death of the Queen of Scots. Camden, who writes really the most official public version of her death, says some attributed it to the loss of Essex. So even in these quite formal public versions of events, um, the, these things come forward. Claire. There's also a very poignant moment about a month before her death as well, where her ring, which has been her sign of her marriage to the state, that her union to the country, as opposed to any man that might produce an heir, um, has to be cut from her finger. It's grown into the flesh. And a lot of people take that to be an omen, that this contract between Elizabeth and her country that had been made at her coronation is now broken. Mm. That's Although, yeah. although, of course, um, there's a different version of that story, uh, which, you know, I mean, uh, comes from... You must have such fun, you guys. I mean, yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, this is, the, this, I mean this, is, this, this is the point, because, you see, Melvin, actually, we don't actually know. Yeah. There are all these, there are all these conflicting... Well, you've been putting up a very convincing... There point. are all these conflicting stories. I mean, the most likely... Uh, I mean, Camden, in a way, reimagined this... You know, retrospectively, I mean, he's writing in James's reign. I mean, he's essentially being paid by the Cecils. Uh, and, uh, you know, I mean, we know that Camden, although he was actually rather responsible as an historian by the standards of the day, we know that he also, I wouldn't say he made things up, but I mean, he saw things in the way that he wanted them to appear, which was part of the way that history was done in those days. But I think there's one, and I've thought about this for many years, I mean, there's one thing that I think has the sort of ring of truth. Robert Carey does say, 
that the Privy Council had this audience with her on the 23rd, the day before, you know, uh, her, her death. You know, and when James's name was mentioned, she raised her hand to her to her head, and, uh, as it were, a, a, a gesture. Now, if that were true, and actually I personally believe it is true, if that were true, then you know, by actually the the law of uh, by um, the law of wills, the uh, testamentary law then that it could be construed as a non-cupative will. You could make a will on your deathbed in front of witnesses. But conveniently, it legalises what, what Cecil... <laughs> it gives him course, some authority of, of, of course, for what, but, course, for what but, he was course, manoeuvring course, away course, But that brings us on. That brings us on to the, you know, to the, if you like, the question of the transition. Because yeah, well, let's get on to that now, because Cecil decides that he's going to take care of this. Mm. And they, the, 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 that Cecil family, they've got us through... They've got us through the Catholic to Protestant, they've got us through the Mary Queen of Scots, and now he's getting us through... The, his son is getting us through this. Um... He brings to, you tell us, but he, just as a headline, he brings together something called the Great Council. Gives this a constitutional ugh, burnish and gets on with it. Well, this to me is the essence of it, because what you have on the death of Elizabeth, as you know, as Claire has uh, said, is essentially an interregnum. When the Queen dies, the authority of the, of the state officials of the court, everything ceases. Now, uh, you've, we've also said, you know, that one of the biggest issues in Elizabeth's reign was the execution of Mary, Queen of Scots, which was, you know, in a sense, the, the, the armada of Elizabeth's soul. And also, if she, as she believed in di the divine right of rule, uh, an offence against God. Absolutely. Now, what happens is that uh, Robert Cecil uses a device that uh, his father, Lord Burley, had invented... When, uh, when Burley was trying to go behind Elizabeth's back and exclude the Queen of Scots from the succession. But he was looking ahead to a world in which suddenly Elizabeth would die, say, from smallpox, which she had in 1562. Now, in 1563 and in the 1580s, he devises a, a scheme for the succession, and that involves uh, the Privy Council reinforcing itself with the no great nobility, and that would be called the Great Council, now, there's a tradition in English history going back to the Middle Ages that the Great Council can summon Parliament in its own name uh, in the absence or incapacity of the monarch. Uh, and what Robert Cecil says is, as his father had said before, that that Great Council could in fact choose a successor, you know, put it to Parliament, get it all ratified, and, you know, bingo, the job is done. And in fact, what uh, the actual if course of events after Elizabeth's death, you know, if we, you know, if we now cut... Uh, or, or scroll back to you know three o'clock uh, in the morning of the twenty fourth of March when Elizabeth dies. Uh, what happens is that immediately Cecil gets uh, as many of the councillors as he can together, and he sends for the Earl of Northumberland. He sends that for the morning, Earl of Shrewsbury. It? It's all done. It's all done by six a.m. By six a.m. at first light, they have had the had the meeting. And here's also something interesting: when that meeting takes place, Robert Cecil sits in the chair. And the Earl of Northumberland, who's the senior peer, says, hang on a minute, this, this ain't the Privy Council. Mm. You know, this is, you know, something different. You know, this is the Great Council. I'm the senior peer. I should sit in the chair. And Robert Cecil says, OK, then. Uh, a little bit worried. But the Earl of Northumberland says, no, it's all right. You can stay there. And that's actually rather a telling, telling detail. Now, the, this Great Council, in fact, then approves, you know, the paperwork you know, the draft proclamation for, for James's uh, accession that Cecil has already had in the bag, in fact, in the filing cabinet, probably for, you know, for, for, for a year or more. And then it's proclaimed at the gates of Whitehall. That morning. That very, it's proclaimed, it's first proclaimed, you know, I mean, sort of six o'clock in the morning. I mean, you know, I mean, it's not even light. So uh, and, then, and, then, and, then the, and then it's done again in the city of London, because as we said, you know, at the, uh, uh, at the outset, you know, what the Londoners said about this, how they, you know, went along with this, you know, is a very, is a, is a very big deal. We'll come to that, remember. So Cecil makes sure that the interregnum lasts precisely three hours. Yeah, but the problem is there's the distance problem with no, James. I'm going to come yeah. to the distance problem, but that's very good. We know where we are now. Um, there's this man, Robert Carey, you mentioned once or twice before, who was a relative of one of the uh, ladies in waiting. Yes. And he wants to get to Scotland as fast as he can. Somebody's got to get there and tell James of the actual death. Cecil wants to control all this, doesn't want him to go. Uh, he illegally, as it were, or against Cecil's wishes, sets off and rides there. 
One of the amazing things is that he gets there in three days. Mm. Did he take spare horses with him? It's 400 miles. Yeah, he, it must have been a tricky track. He had horses set up all along the route. How did he get Scotland? them set up? I mean, there was no... He, he'd made plans. You know, he'd written letters, already, made yeah. plans well ahead. Everyone's foreseeing this event. You know, he's got it all laid on. But still three days. Yeah, he rides at full tilt. He does have an accident on the way. He falls off his horse part of the way there and is kicked in the head by his horse, but continues and makes it to James at nightfall on the 26th of March, which is rather extraordinary, yes. He gets there, he proves that he's, he's good because he's got this ring. And what does James, how does James meet, meet and or greet him? With great delight. I think this is what James has been waiting for for a very long time. And James sends his salutations back to the council. But James doesn't use the right form of words. So again, there's um, a slight moment Let's of... Let's take it for a moment because it's yes. fascinating. He, he, he went there in order to get a reward, Claire. What did he get a reward from James? Did he, did he, worth it? he did, um, but then so did lots of other people at this stage. I mean, one of the stories of the next few weeks is the extent to which James has to create loyalty immediately. I mean, the, as John Guy init initially said, one of the uncertainties of, an, uh, of not knowing who's going to succeed is actually people having to back the right horse. And James very quickly finds it's not just Carey, then it's not just Percy and Somerset, the officials, but it's actually most of the English hierarchy who start flooding north, not to contest James's right, but immediately to sort of pledge their allegiance. Um, so when the poor bleeding Carey arrives, uh, and James has already gone to bed and he falls to his feet and acc acc um, acclaims him King of Scotland, England, Ireland, sort of somewhat euphemistically France as well. The moment James has been waiting for, James later says, is there anything I can do for you? And he says, well, I'd like to be a gen gentleman in the bedchamber. And James says, that's fine. Can we just finish this correspondence, though, Helen? I interrupted you. So James, <coughs> James writes back and says, I accept, or whatever he says. It isn't good enough, though. He doesn't phrase it properly. He doesn't use the right form of words to reaffirm mm. the council in their positions. And so they have to write to him again. And he has to reply again, somewhat tetchily, I think, having had his first experience of English bureaucracy saying, oh, all right, then, you know, here's the right form of words, you can assume your authority. English now. constitutionalism, which he didn't like. Yes, yeah, yeah. that's right, yes. Um, I think, I mean, we, we shouldn't also lose sight of the fact, you know, since we're talking about the instability of all this, that Robert Carey actually slipped out without permission. Yes. Mm -hmm. That actually Cecil had told the gates, of the, you know, the porters to lock the gates and no one's to go out. Why did Cecil want no one to go? Did because, he want his man to go yeah, out? Yeah, because, well, he wanted to control it. It isn't actually that, it, it, you know, he might not have sent Carey. He might have sent Kerry, but of course he hadn't. He hadn't given the signal to go. You see, it's all a matter of you know who controls the the power and how Kerry got out of the palace is quite interesting, because in fact after you know Cecil had gone, you know um, Kerry's brother, the old Lord Hunsdon, told the porter to open the gate, and he was also on the council. You see, it's extraordinary. Even within the council, it's family because that touches to a, 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 to the heart of you know the way that politics works. It isn't just institutions; it's families. Families work together in their own interests, and those interests can come to, sometimes cross the interests of the, st of the state. You, we talked about it being proclaimed f <coughs> at 6am uh, and then it had to be proclaimed in London. Now London's reaction from the reading what you three have written was rather unusual. Can Who wants to dive in on well, that? John Helen? Manningham's a very useful yes. source on this. I, I mentioned him earlier, <laughs> this um, student at the Inns of Court, a law student, and he writes a very vivid account of how the people hear the proclamation in silence. He says there's no shouting, uh, nothing happens. And he gives a very vivid sense of London really existing in a sort of suspended animation. Why was that? Because it's this mingling of this anxiety and anticipation, I think. A, a lot of people have right at the time of how people thought that Elizabeth's death would be like a thunderbolt. They trembled at the prospect. Quite apart from all the specific threats from specific alternative claimants or Spanish invasion, I think there's a general fear that things will just break down into anarchy. There'll just be disorder. Uh, Thomas Decker writes, this nation was begotten and born under her. No one had ever known any other monarch. They couldn't quite imagine life without her. And I think they just, in a quite sort of vague general sense, thought everyone would be up in arms, their houses would be sacked and spoiled. This doesn't happen. So we have these few hours of silence of tremendous stillness in London as everyone waits with bated breath and then in the evening they start lighting bonfires they start ringing bells and then increasingly a sense of celebration breaks out and relief in fact that it's all been achieved peaceably can we talk about sorry you wanted to say something like because I only asked you a question anyway oh well, what was the question and the question was before he comes down and James sends down a book Basilicon Doran uh, which sells an amazing 16,000 copies to the then tiny, in that then tiny population of London. This is uh, quite a, can, what, why is that important? Well, it's quite a strategic move on James's part. Um, he actually sends it down the day before Elizabeth dies, so he gets his timing very good. It's a book that he wrote in uh, and published for his 
son and heir, at that stage his only son and heir, Prince Henry in 1599, so it's already been published in Scotland. It's the more informal handbook of practical kingship. It's really telling Henry how to be a king, what a king's duties are before God, what a king's duties are before his subjects. James writes two tracts, actually, about kingship. Uh, it's not the more systematic true law of free monarchists that had appeared the year before. This is a very much how-to-do-it um, manual. James sends one copy down um, the day before Elizabeth dies. As you say, within three weeks, there's from that one copy, there's eight different editions, about 15,000, 16,000 copies. At that point, the plague hits London, so we don't really know much thereafter. There's been a lot of bibliographic work done on it, um, the book, to suggest that actually... It was a book that perhaps wasn't read very well. The, the, the large numbers of copies that survive and the good condition that they're in suggest that either it wasn't read or it was read maybe once. Um, but actually, had people read it and um, engaged with it, if you like, it would have given quite a good indication of the type of monarchy that James intended to operate in practice. A lot of people have seen it as a sort of Jacobean equivalent of a coronation mug. People bought it more to cherish than to actually read. Can we come back to London now, <coughs> John? Um, he must know that James has got the news, obviously, by then, because... Uh, how's he holding things together? Is he the man in charge? He must. Uh, London is now celebrating and accepting. Cecil. What's go Cecil? Yes. I mean Cecil. Yeah. Yes. Uh, yes. I mean C Cecil now is, is, <coughs> is holding the fort. I mean they managed to get, but I mean it takes even you know days to get this letter of authority you know back. I mean it's a very interesting you know difference of opinion about the nature of of, of a rule as you, you you said. I mean the English essentially want to do this in the English constitutional way. James just think you know Bizelli and Doron essentially you know puts the theory of divine right kingship. I must point out that Jones had been a king since he was 13 months he, old, he so, had, he, so had. he thought he knew how to do it. He had, but of course there are different styles of kingship, mm. and, and, and you, you know, what's happening in, in, in what was happening in Scotland was that James's theory of kingship was being framed essentially in a polemical sense against the Presbyterians, you know, who actually, you know, didn't want um, that sort of divine right kingship and didn't want the, the king ever interfering, you know, with, with the with, 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 with the Kirk. So in a way, the St James's Scottish background is pushing him towards, if you like, a more exalted theory of, of kingship than you actually would expect from 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 a Scot from a Scot from a Scottish king. What was Cecil's problems then in this business where we... There's a manoeuvring going on, isn't it, between London and Edinburgh. There are, there, there are days difference just mm -hmm. getting things back and forward. Mm -hmm. Everybody can't mm -hmm. ride as fast as Kerry, so we're talking about a week or so for a letter. Okay. But so, Cecil can't ride there. He's, he, he's got to stay in London. No, he can't ride there, but, he, but how is he holding things together? In London? Yeah. Uh, with difficulty. With great difficulty. Uh, and, you know, if, if, if you like, the instability, the structural instability in the system... You know, is actually is is, is actually is, is actually there because it, to, to 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 say to hold down London, you need to have the mayor, the aldermen, the authorities in London, the civic authorities who control the watches. You know, the equivalent of the, of the police on your side. They do that. Cecil does that by binding in the mayor of London into this into into this great you know council. this great council. Come, sorry, I, I was I, just going to say. I think one thing that helps Cecil a lot is that there is this popular upswelling of support for James. I think people are very pleased to have a male monarch. They think he's going to be more active, more martial than Elizabeth was. The, the elegies, there are elegies published for Elizabeth's death, but not that many of them. In fact, a theme <laughs> of the elegies is that they are quite rare. A lot of the poets write about how other poets are not writing. Henry Chettle, who writes an elegy, specifically chides Shakespeare for not writing an elegy. But the ones that do appear, they say things like, Eliza's dead, that rends my heart in twain. And James proclaimed, that makes me well again. So I think the general popular feeling is that people want James, they don't want any of the other claimants and that helps Cecil you want to pop in, then there's two things I want to talk about before we finish. I was going to say a very obvious way in which your your your, your question could have been answered was to actually summon James, but James himself has made it very clear that he doesn't want to appear until after Elizabeth's funeral. That's what I want to talk about. Elizabeth's funeral. Now, that was one of the most expensive pageant yes. demonstrations that had been for centuries. Well, yes, can well, you tell us a bit about it? it? It's very lavish. It's on the 28th of April. It's a huge procession through London, and in fact, a lot of the elegies, they include a list of who's in the procession. Um, and it's fascinating because it includes even the most lowly members of the, the royal household, so people like the maker of spice bags and the wine porters and the scullery maids, they're all in this procession. And then, of course, all the lords, the council, um, and at the end of it, there's the hearse with a life-size effigy of Elizabeth lying on the coffin. Uh, Thomas Is Decker... That uh, no, it's wooden. It's painted right. wood. Um, Thomas Decker describes how never had England seen so much black worn as on that day. There's a, a whole sense of London has been kind of swathed in black. And he says the hearse is like an island in an ocean of tears. So a great public outpouring of grief. So certainly the forms of mourning are very much observed, despite what I've said about the allergies.
and that was was well and truly stamped the beginning of the posthumous uh, mythic status of Elizabeth. Well, it did for a few days. I mean, I think in a way, the sort of atmosphere of Elizabeth's funeral, I mean, having had that instability and people wanting her to go in, Bishop Goodman said later, you know, the people were weary of an old woman's government. Mm -hmm. It's a bit like the funeral of Princess Diana. You know, there was this in sort of enormous, uh, on a, but on a, perhaps on a smaller scale, there was this sort of enormous sort of um, I mean, know, sort of moment. Scale. Mm. We're getting mixed up here. Let's no, no, the Elizabeth, on a, Elizabeth on a smaller scale. Yeah. Uh, there's this sort of, if you like, almost sort of hysteria. You know, the Queen, 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 and nostalgia. But of course, the idea that um, Elizabeth was a better ruler than James, it seems to me, comes in really much later. Much it comes later. in in the, in the 1620s. Sorry, if I can just briefly yeah. come and we do get mythification going on there. A lot of emphasis is oh, yes, placed do, on how um, she was born on the eve of the Feast of the Nativity of the Virgin Mary and she dies on the eve of the Feast of the Annunciation so these are two Marian feasts and this is mentioned a lot in the elegies in the accounts of the funeral and they're seen as showing that she's now some sort of virgin saint in heaven there's a lot of expression of the idea that she's now crowned in heaven so she begins to be apotheosized yes, at this that's point. Yes, that's what I was try, trying rather, rather feebly to get that. Claire Jackson uh, he comes down from Scotland it takes quite a long time to come down from Scotland all his goods Forty odd days, something like that. Well, this funeral actually is five weeks after Elizabeth yes. dies, so that sets a different kind of timetable. Yes. But his journey, he doesn't come to London for the funeral. <laughs> no, he doesn't come to London for the funeral. He makes very clear that he's not going to arrive in London after the funeral. Um, he wants, he's, a, he's a passionate hunter. I mean, this is the one thing that James is, is absolutely passionate about. And he wants her that every English gentleman kept his country park well stocked. And he intended basically to hunt his way down basically the A1. Um, and he takes his, his time about it. Um, he leaves Edinburgh on the 5th of April. He's already tried to assure his Scottish people. I mean, I think one of the, the themes that um, isn't often picked up is that the English often resent a lot of money being spent on Scot Scotland, but they don't really realise that the sacrifice that the Scots are making. I mean, they may have succeeded where Elizabeth failed in giving the English a, a monarch, but they ha they, from now on they're going to be an absentee monarch. So James tries to leave with a rhetoric, I will come back salmon-like to whence I was spawned very regularly. He actually never goes back once to Scotland. But he sets off on the 5th of April. He basically, as I say, goes down the, the A1, um, Berwick, Newcastle, York, taking a lot of time off to hunt. Um, uh, stops in Nottinghamshire, Doncaster. He spends the night of Elizabeth's funeral um, in Hinchingbrook near Huntingdon uh, with an Oliver Cromwell, who's the uncle of the Lord Protector. Um, but he, this costs a lot of money, and right from the outset, he says he's going to need um, sort of relocation expenses if you need, from, if you like, from the English Treasury, and the, the figure of five thousand is mooted around, which is kind of about the equivalent of about half a million now. And one of the, one of Cecil's problems is to stop floods of Englishmen driving, uh, coming north to join this this enormous train that is following James. It's phenomenally expensive for those gentry that are having to accommodate this royal progression making its way down. Um, James also has a series of hunting accidents um, en route um, that that reinforce the fragility of this. I mean, his son his son and heir is only nine. Um, and James, one of the reasons that by the time James gets to London eventually, people often see his, his arrival with his obsession about wanting to unite England and Scotland politically as his own pet project. But it is an indication of the way in which James realises that this link now between Scotland and England is actually really quite fragile. It's just the two crowns. He's only the, 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 the successor to both of these crowns. If in a time of plague and high mortality, four people die, i.e. him and his three children, that link would be broken again. So by the time he gets to London, he's, he's a practising king, but he's got, this, he's got this further agenda. But on the journey up to London, uh, John, John Guy, he's already doing things that, that maybe... Did they cause concern at the time? He's very extravagant, that's one thing. He's creating an awful lot of knighthoods, that's another thing. But then he hangs a thief without due he, process. Exactly, he hangs a thief without due process. He says, I am process. the living law without Absol English due process. And Absolutely, he says, he, sa he says he's a lex loquens, he's the speaking law, which mm. is, of course, you know, the metaphor for, you know, an absolute... Uh, that's not quite the right word. They would have said a divine right to king. Now, the last time a monarch had threatened to hang somebody without due process of law was Elizabeth, uh, when William Davison sent the warrant uh, for the execution of Mary Queen of Scots and let it leave his possession uh, after, she, uh, after she had told him in fact that it should not leave his possession uh, and even, even Elizabeth didn't do it although she, you know, I mean, you know, she said she really wanted to. Uh, I mean, for James to do it, it's almost re quite, really quite remarkable. Now that's one alarm bell. Another alarm bell is that, uh, you know, this hunting down the A1 you know, actually, which of course also means that many of the decisions have to be made by correspondence, is a, is a style 
that he keeps up, you know, really throughout his reign. And that's a very different sort of, uh, you know, monarchy from the Elizabethan, um, you know, style hands on. And the third thing that I think really, you know, rings a, a chord is that when he does get down to London, uh, it isn't that it isn't that long before he issues, I mean, James has great schemes for the, you know, the, for the future. He issues proclamations without consulting, you know, Parliament and, and pro you know, possibly not even consulting the, the Privy Council in a formal sense that there should be, you know, um, a, um, a, a he, he should be King of Great Britain, you know, that there should be um, a, a, an integrated coinage, you know, that there should be a British flag. Just one, we get him, we haven't got, we'd, we've got to get him to London to finish the story, to get him crowned. It's, it's, not, it's not a great occasion, that, is it? No, because of the plague. The coronation is on the 25th of July, 1603, but by then the plague is at its height in London. He has to get crowned because plots are hatching, and some of the plotters are arguing that it's no treason to plot against an uncrowned king. So he and his queen, Anne of Denmark, they are crowned. But normally the coronation would be preceded by a triumphal entry through the city of London. That can't happen because of the plague. So that's postponed to March 1604. That means that when that happens, there's been months and months to spend in planning it. There's been a royal commission. It's a very splendid occasion with wonderful triumphal arches, verses by Ben Jonson and Thomas Decker. And it means that when that happens, James progresses through London as very much a reigning monarch rather than a monarch on his way to the crown. Well, thank you all very much. That was a terrific gallop. <laughs> Faster than he came down the A1, anyway. Um, thank you very much, John Guy, Helen Hackett, Claire Jackson. Next week we'll be talking about the geological formation of Britain, which began 600 million years ago. Thank you for listening. Thanks for downloading the In Our Time podcast. For more details about In Our Time and for our terms of use, please go to bbc.co.uk forward slash radio 4. I hope you enjoy the programme.